Hello, and thank you for joining today. My name is Jennifer Hill, an education specialist at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. In addition to hosting broadcast, I have the honor of coordinating the Native Youth Climate Adaptation Leadership Congress, a week-long on-site program for Indigenous high school youth to grow in leadership, which we welcome you to learn more about. Before moving into our broadcast, I would like to acknowledge, I'm sorry, I think I'm getting feedback, Rob. There we go. Uh, before we move into our broadcast, I would like to acknowledge that the National Conservation Training Center is located on the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. While we haven't accounted for uh, all of the peoples that have been on this land, we are aware that many peoples have traversed, cherished, and lived on this land. They include the Massawamek, the Haudenosaunee, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. As we learn more about the indigenous people who continue to have relationships with this land, we better appreciate the good earth on which we work, live, and learn. And we pledge to grow and sustain relationships with indigenous communities through collaboration on our training, outreach, youth programs, museum exhibits, and more. We encourage each of you to learn more about the land on which you work and reside. Today, we will hear from Amy Langford Kaufman, the Tribal Coast Stewardship Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Wildlife Refuge System, as she shares about coast stewardship and collaboration within the National Wildlife Refuge System. Amy Langford Kaufman has a diverse background in field work and has worked in many different roles within the wildlife refuges, regions, and now headquarters. Amy has developed long-term collaborative land management plans with incredibly important tribal partners and has been part of many great projects that have shaped her as a conservationist. She was born in Montana, raised on the Flathead Reservation, and was able to come back to it after a long period of being away while working around the nation. Previous positions included Bureau of Indian Affairs, Superintendent of the Flathead Agency in Montana, then as a Native American liaison for the Mountain Prairie Region or Region 6 in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Office of Communications. Amy, thank you for joining us today. I'll now hand it over to you. All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Jen, for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> I just want to reiterate that my name is Amy um, Linkford Kaufman, um, and I am in Northwest Montana on the Flathead Reservation. Um, I was born and raised here. My parents are, are Tom Linkford um, from Eastern Montana. My mom is Rhonda Whiting from Western Montana. Um, I come from the Bitterroot Salish people and also Ani people uh, on the eastern side of Montana. So I'm definitely a Montana girl through and through. Uh, I am thankful to be here. Um, it's been a long time coming for this new position to be enlisted in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I am part of the National Wildlife Refuge System um, where we can serve and protect for future generations. Um, we have a very unique responsibility to work within um, our realm to steward the lands and waters in which we share with everybody. So I want to just thank you all for being here today. Um, and I want to make sure that you all know I will be doing a presentation today. Um, my presentation is what I know, um, where I come from, um, it's a heavy background to that. and. Also, I, I'm not here to ever offend anybody or that is not my intention. So I wanna make sure that everybody knows that I'm just giving information on coast stewardship within the National Wildlife Refuge System and our um, <clears throat> work that we are currently doing right now and the importance of it. But before we get going, I would really like my, my friends at NCTC to help me do a Mentimeter um, it's a survey just to see where everybody's at with coast stewardship. I know this is a word that most folks are hearing right now. So uh, I was going to ask everybody, where are you joining from today? If you could just go ahead and plug that in. Oh, 
Okay. Looks like we have folks from quite a few places. All right, should we move on to the next? Okay, who is with us today? What agency or what other affiliation might you be with? Or are you just joining us today from the public? So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, pretty heavy. I'd like you to share one word that comes to mind when you hear the term co-stewardship. Great. So Amy, it looks it looks like some folks are having a hard time entering data, but we do have someone with um, National Park Service, Native American Affairs, a tribal liaison. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's also with us. Just so you're aware. Great. Okay. Opportunity, community, tribal, need land back, partnership, opportunities, working, intergenerational, legacy together. It's great. Partnership seems to be a pretty similar one for folks. As of right now, 
How comfortable are you with advancing tribal coast stewardship as a priority? Okay. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> it says the link to join just goes to a screen that says the event will start soon. People aren't able to see the broadcast. You're getting that message too? Yeah. So give him, I'm teams, I just put in the, uh, in your team's chat, the YouTube link to send to them. Okay. Thank you. I guess we just switched platforms. So, so apologies, everyone. We've just switched platforms from VBRIC and, um, that link is not working for some reason. Okay. Oh, darn. Okay. Okay. Describe what you believe tribal coast stewardship means for you in your current role. Not sure what it means. It's collaboration words. Great. Indigenous knowledge, I like seeing that. Okay. Have you engaged with tribes beyond statutory requirements? If so, please share some examples if you're comfortable doing so. Thank you.
All right, these are all great. Not yet is good, means we're thinking about it. How to make basket, it's great. Young tribal members come to professional development days. Great. All right, these are all great. Mm-hmm. What support do you need to better engage with work, engage with and work with tribes? Okay, thank you for these responses. I don't want to be a colonizer handbook. <laughs> Okay. Thank you everybody for contributing to that. I appreciate that. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and just jump into the presentation that I have for you all today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Please let me know okay. if you're able to see it. Rob, I think we're hearing feedback, just FYI.
Rob, I think we're hearing feedback. FYI. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. Again, this is Empowering Coast Stewardship Within the National Wildlife Refuge System on the Indigenous Connections broadcast, April 2024. Again, I just want to let everybody know my name is Amy Langford Kaufman. For some folks, I might have jumped on late. Um, I am a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee. I have a pretty long career with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I was a refuge manager for many years. Um, I took a stint with BIA. I've been a Native American liaison. I am a direct descendant of Bitterroot Salish. I am also an enrolled member of the Omni tribe of the Fort Belknap Reservation. I reside here in Montana on the Flathead Reservation. I'm happy to be home. I was born and raised here. So I will go ahead. I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that came forth at the beginning of the um, request to join this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and just put those into my presentation as I can. If you don't feel like you get all the answers to your questions, please reach out to me. I will leave my information with you at the end of this presentation. So I want to go ahead and just say that all the movement towards new tribal coast stewardship is really not new. It is part of our obligation to the Native Americans that we work with. It is not just a political priority. It is a trust responsibility. It's an opportunity for us all in the Wildlife Service, National Wildlife Refuge System, to model a good way of doing work with our partners. We can create pathways and not make them seem like they are hard projects to do. So I want to give an overview. <clears throat> I want to continue to highlight the requirements and the benefits of coast stewardship work in our prioritization and messaging to all employees in the, in the refuge system. We must create a culture where tribal engagement is the forefront of every conservation effort and is held at a deeply ingrained responsibility. We want to continue to have regular discussions on coast stewardship and coordination of formal agreements and other issues to ensure a consistent and coordinated approach for future land stewardship within the National Wildlife Refuge System. I'm going to give an overview of the leader's intent that was put out prior to the Direct Order 227 by Martha Williams and the Joint Secretarial Order 3404 between USDA and DOI. <clears throat> I'll be talking about the Coast Stewardship Committee that came from the leader's intent, the action plan that's associated with it, the call to action, and some follow-up on that. So we're creating a model of, in the definition of the refuge systems approach to proactive and strategic collaboration with indigenous communities, <clears throat> which is rooted in cultural awareness and respect. We want to build, build enduring relationships, create trust, create durable change, and do well as we move forward. It was established, the leader's intent established, as I said, the Coast Stewardship Committee. These are, this consists of employees that work within the refuge system and are aware and are knowledgeable on how to fulfill our federal trust obligations <clears throat> and help provide the tools, training, and resources to do so to other U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuge system employees. Overall, we want to create durable documents that help us be better in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I just want to give a huge thank you to my Coast Stewardship Committee members within the regions. Um, these are not 
their jobs that they have every day, but they are very dedicated folks. If anybody got missed on this committee members list, I apologize for that. So within the committee, we have four sub teams. We have the geographical connections. We have guiding principles. We have a consultation, big C, little C, formal, informal sub team. We have a communication sub team. The committee embarked on a strategic planning process encompassing key steps to ensure a comprehensive and effective approach towards achieving our coast stewardship goals. By following the strategic planning process, we've established a clear roadmap to guide the refuge systems towards the desired future state while effectively addressing barriers capitalizing on opportunities and ensuring a focused and actionable plan for success. We are in close coordination also with the service-wide efforts of the National Coast Stewardship Coordination Team. The National Wildlife Refuge Coast Stewardship Committee is a sub-team essentially of that larger team that is cross-programmatic. Refuges sits in its own Team. Okay, so I also want to let you guys know that we developed an action plan. It is internal to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge System right now. I'd like to release that soon as we get it finalized. It includes strategic actions that are based around critical elements the tasks at hand associated okay. with completing those. It's got categories of need and ability. It's really, again, associated with our National Coast Stewardship Work Plan goals, the resources available, and other items as they come up. <clears throat> so this is really the um, <clears throat> technical administrative part of the work that we're doing. So I want to let you guys know where we want to go with this. We would like to see the National Wildlife Refuge System leadership, which means all employees of the National Wildlife Refuge System build and foster relationships with our tribal partners, make room at our table, communicate effectively and thoughtfully. We want everybody to know your land's histories and know every land is indigenous lands and accept that. Make sure that you're in developing all interpretive materials with our indigenous partners leadership. And in that picture over here, that is a Nine Pipe National Wildlife Refuge. Um, those are the signs that have trilingual language from the Kasanka and Salish people of the Flathead Reservation. That was an effort to recognize the indigenous names of the areas that were National Wildlife Refuges. These lands are actually located on the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes lands. It was designated as a refuge by tribal request. So it's Fish and Wildlife Service managed and it's tribal lands. We have a a good relationship there. We work together often. Uh, it was one of my previous stations when I was a national bison range manager as well, too. Bottom line, I want to tell everybody that it's most important to include your indigenous partners from the beginning of every project. And just to put this out there as well, this project of this signage took about a year to do because we followed the proper protocol, not only through solicitors, but through cultural committees, through the right people, through tribal councils, through our sign program, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. But most importantly, I think what came from it was the names in the native language of these areas. I'm going to give an example as well of just some ideas to help with the tribal engagement process. Um, this was done by one of my DFPs, Director of Fellowship Program Fellows, Stephanie Barone, in 2023. It was improving tribal communications. Um, this was actually adopted from, I believe, Park Service um, 
part actions. And so this is after action review of a project that you do with any tribe and is talking about conceptual conceptualization, implementation, project completion, debriefs, and after action reports. And this can be requested by US Fish and Wildlife Service or tribal representatives in which you work with. I think this is a great way to start communications, which, hold, which holds you really accountable to the process of doing all the work that you do, besides having really important relationships with the tribal partners that we work with. For the National Wildlife Refuge System, we have created a toolkit, which is really um, right now internal to the uh, National Wildlife Refuge System. It provides examples of cooperative agreements, collaboration, successful projects, annual funding agreements, 638 contracts that have already occurred within Fish and Wildlife Service, National Wildlife Refuges, and the tribal partners that we work with. It's a toolkit to provide a lot of resources on cross-cultural communication, consultation, guiding principles, and geographical locations. So that is within the National Wildlife Refuge System's hands. It is located on the the share point in which we all have. So it defines, really it helps us to find how the National Wildlife Refuge System will work with indigenous communities and employees. <clears throat> so a lot of the questions that I got um, revolved around Native American policy prior to this call. The one thing that I really wanna point out is that we do have a lot of accountability that we need to answer to as an agency. I think we do a good job of you know, really recognizing that we have a lot of account accountability, but our language in the, within the Native American policy kind of allows for us to waver outside of that sometimes, perhaps. Um, it has words like when capacity allows, regular and periodic, when serviceable, as appropriate as resources and priorities allow. So we do just ask ourselves all the time, I'm not saying anything bad about what, the work that we're doing right now, but are we holding ourselves accountable? We need to make sure that we are. Because like I said, this is not just a political priority. This is a trust responsibility that we have to tribes. So I want to go into a personal story of mine and just talk a little bit about myself, how I got here, why this is so important to me, uh, also my family, and just a good example, because I do get asked often about the Vice Range. I was the Vice Range manager um, during the time of transition to the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes. And so when I started with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the bison range was my first position. I grew up on the Flathead Reservation where the bison range was essentially a federal national wildlife refuge in the middle of the reservation. So <clears throat> it was always a point of contention between the tribes and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, federal government. Um, there was a lot of issues and mistrust that occurred along the way um some inadvertently some were not good at all and so i just want to point out um my family member here he's recently passed and i'm respectfully pointing him out because when i joined the u.s fish and wildlife service as a refuge manager i didn't know what i was getting into i started at the national bison range thinking like, wow, this is great. I get to meet with visitors, count birds, hang out with bison, ride horses. I thought it was great, but it was so much more important than that. 
So the National Bison Range was actually established historically with the federal government and a relative of mine having some part of it um, suggesting the Bison Range is a great area to, to have the Bison Range. It was Duncan McDonald, which is our relation. So this is my relation, Joe McDonald, Dr. Joe McDonald, and Duncan McDonald was my relative as well too. So Joe McDonald told me when I came back to manage the Bison Range, he said, we have come a long way. He said, when they established a the National Bison Range, which has a long history of establishment, <clears throat> not always the, it wasn't the brightest of histories. It was established, a fence was put up, and there was an armed guard on the outside of the, the gate of the Bison Range. And so Joe McDonald said, it's no longer that armed guard. He said, it's a peaceful guard. And that was me. I got to be the peaceful guard of the National Bison Range. I was also very, very um, blessed to be able to transfer it along to CSKT, Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, as I moved through my career. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to take a minute too and talk about big medicine. So big medicine was a big part of the National Bison Range. It was a white bison, very unique um, in character. It was he was completely white. He was not albino. He represented hope for the tribes. Um, his bloodline still exists within many of the bison populations within the U.S. As the National Bison Range was a. a the herd there was a very important herd for bison reestablishment in the United States. So the bison range is very important. It's now the CSKT bison range. They are thriving as they do the work that they are going forward doing. They are work very closely still with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as partners in the area because we do manage a lot of other lands within the, the reservation. Um, <clears throat> a lot of those are fee Title lands, which are owned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Wildlife Refuge System. However, some of them are tribal, like I said, and they are managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Overall, the relationship is great um, moving forward, and I believe we can do the same work in other places and already are doing that work within the National Wildlife Refuge System lands that we steward. We have a very important job to do. And I just want to move into the next slide and give everybody just a moment to read the quote that I'm going to put through to you all. And I'll go ahead and read it to everybody as well, too. I used to think the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we as scientists don't know how to do that. This quote really resonates for me. The word apathy spiritual and cultural transformations are absolutely where we're at right now and <clears throat> if a scientist after 30 years of good science even recognizes this it's a very important time for us to start working closely with our tribal partners we have a very unique responsibility within the u.s fish and wildlife service and we're moving forward to do it in the best way that we can my question is to everybody is what is getting in the way? How have we already been advancing this work? How do we keep doing it? Are there any gaps? What do we need to do to keep doing this work? For me, I say it's trust and response in relationships with our partners that we have moving forward. I want to give us enough time at the end of this to ask questions and just have some dialogue um, between us.
Okay, so this is my contact information. Lem Lunch says thank you in Salish. I want everybody to know if I do not answer any of your questions, please, please take that information here and contact me at any any point in time. I'm going to go ahead and put this into the chat as well. I'm going to go ahead and conclude that. Okay, can you all see me again? We can see you in my okay, very pixelate, pixelated self. I don't know what's going on with my connection. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there was some issues. I apologize, everybody, for people being able to get in here. If I am pixelated, I'm sorry. If you have questions, please, please, um, you know, ask following this presentation. But I wanted to make sure that I gave enough time for everybody to ask me questions or so I can provide you some answers or I can go find the answers for you. Yeah, thank you, Amy. We appreciate you sharing. Um, and we'll give some time for folks to enter their questions into the chat and then um, get those over here to us. So in the meantime, um, Amy, I want to thank you for sharing your story about your relative Joe McDonald and also about big medicine. Um, I'm assuming that was the that time frame you had under that picture was the age of that of that bison. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, he was a really old pretty bison. <laughs> Yeah, wow. he was. He was very, very important to the Salish and Kootenai people as well, too, and Kalispe Spade people. Um, he is recently, he was sitting at a museum in Helena, Montana, which is the capital of Montana, and was recently mm -hmm. moved back to the National Bison Range to be put on display in their visitor center, which I think is very appropriate um, to happen and a, a great move. Um, for Montana, the state of Montana, to do that for them. So, fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you could just put your email in the chat and then Rob, and then we'll get that over to the okay. listeners for today's broadcast. And we'll also post it with the broadcast okay. when it goes online. Um, and then I guess what well, one of the questions is what support do you see coming down from from this effort to better engage with tribes to better engage and work with tribes, but you can answer that after you type. I don't want to. Okay, I know how I would do multitasking. Sure. So as mentioned, I mentioned for the US Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge System, uh, there is a um, toolkit that we're providing that the National Wildlife Refuge System Coast Stewardship Committee is providing to staff within the <clears throat> National Wildlife Refuge System. I believe that there will be service-wide um, toolkits perhaps that are coming out in the future, um, but I am just in charge of the National Wildlife Refuge System. So there are trainings as well on Native Relations um, that are coming out, which are going to be really, really great. Um, like I said, it comes down to cross-cultural communication, um, understanding Native American policy, understanding our obligations, um, <clears throat> formal and informal consultation. Um, we have a lot of a lot of resources just online that are out there. But I would say first and foremost. Um, it's it's really um, important that there's a focus on on building relationships, um, understanding who you are working with, um, being respectful of the indigenous presence that is there or was there in the past in the areas in which we're managing and working with. Um, so there are resources such as that coming down the 
the pipe. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just type this in because I'm trying to talk and do this at the same time, like you said. <laughs> Okay. There we go. So I finally got up, that out there. I apologize for the delay. <clears throat> no so worries. Thank you very much. There, no problem. Yeah, as far as there being more resources or items coming out, um, we are working towards training. We recognize there's a need. Um, <clears throat> we recognize that there is, they're just the basics. Um, of coming into the National Wildlife Refuge System and Fish and Wildlife Service that uh, we're looking at providing, which is basic policy understanding, Native American policy understanding as well. Um, there's new indigenous knowledge policy that just came out. Um, there's gonna be some information on that coming out as well too. Uh, lots, lots of information out there, not to overload anybody, um, but it is something that's coming out to help us be better in the field, to be better land stewards with our partners. Is there any have other you, questions? Um, have you had conversations or discussions with some of the other DOI agencies about coast stewardship and the and how we don't bombard tribes or how we maybe streamline our processes where tribes are so overwhelmed and they have capacity building um, issues mm -hmm. and that we are trying to work together with them instead of maybe pulling them in so many directions. Are there any talks about how to, how to go at that? Yeah, so there's a recognition. Um, <clears throat> I hear it a lot from tribes that they are feeling very overwhelmed by us because we do have these directors orders, secretarial orders. We have new um, tribal coast stewardship efforts in place, and we are, are bombarding tribes with emails and just contacting. That's a lot for them to keep up with. Um, tribes do. You need to recognize that they do have capacity issues. Um, in some places, uh, <clears throat> also te technology issues or um, the ability to, you know, they have changeover as well too, and just responding to every single issue that we bring to them <laughs> um, is a little bit tough sometimes as an agency. And we're not the only agency doing that. So between us and other agencies, we recognize that we are not the only ones doing uh, the re out to them and so <clears throat> there are efforts to just have build personal relationships I think that's what it comes down to um, if you have something that is um, important or an opportunity that you have to work with tribes um, I recommend taking it directly to them um, the best way that you can uh, in person <laughs> you know and also you know I feel like <clears throat> it's not an overload of work. You're actually going to find that organically when you start working with our partners, um, when available, they're going to provide, it's going to organically, like I said, um, open up a lot of doors for a lot of good work to happen. I don't see it as extra work. I see it as actually um, really beneficial work in moving forward. And so there are a lot of discussions about that, but we do need to recognize as an agency that we do overload tribes with all of our needs and wants um, and our opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe how to present them in a in a way and, and pay attention mm -hmm. to how we're presenting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I highly recommend, um, you know, any cross commu communication, cross cultural communication, um, information that you can gather 
um, it will definitely help you work through a lot of your relationships or misunderstandings that we may have. Um, face to face meetings, not jumping the gun so fast, not coming somewhere with an agenda will help you um, let things kind of build themselves as you, as you move forward. So there's a lot of those, you know, items. It's just the basic foundations of, um, you know, talking with people and, you know, understanding what their needs are you know, before our needs. We are not um, the only agency coming at them. Meet them where they are um, <clears throat> and make sure that you're being really thoughtful of, you know, other people as humans, as we are not the top priority for them uh, most of the time. However, they under, you know, try for the most part, and I'm not speaking for every tribe or indigenous group ever, but <clears throat> when you're conserving uh, any land, habitat, you're conserving culture. And so we need to be cognizant of that, that the entire existence of native peoples is really based on land and its inhabitants. Um, the word management is kind of a weird word. Uh, we don't manage any of it. We coexist with it. And so we need to just be thinking about that as we're approaching items um, that we need to do, approaching our projects. I always say not our projects. I try to change that word to pathways. And by the way, like, words are really, really important. Um, make sure that when you're thinking about your words as you put them out there, <clears throat> microaggressions happen. Um, we have really colonialized minds. Um, I saw that come up in the comments often. Um, just be thinking about everything you, you're saying very thoughtfully because you might not think it's offensive, but it can be offensive to somebody. And it was not your intention to be that way. And then it's hard to build that relationship again. I would also caution people to know, you know, and this is just coming from me, we are not going to be perfect at this work that we do. Nobody expects us to be perfect, but we are all human. We are all in this together and we can do the work together. And it's the way to move forward with indigenous people. We can move forward. They have been here longer, longer than we have as an agency. And <clears throat> we can do very, very good moving forward in, in <clears throat> definitely stewarding the lands and waters in which we have responsibility to. Were there any other Thank questions? You. Well said. I haven't seen any questions come in through our chat. Um, I have one question I think would be a good one to wrap up with. And that I think, well, you've kind of hit on this a couple times, but we'll see what you say. Um, if there was okay. one suggestion, which is kind of hard when working with tribes, understanding that all tribes are very diverse, um, but if there was a suggestion you could give to refuge employees specifically when thinking about, you know, this this co-stewardship that's been going on and now it's kind of got a coined term, right? Um, but what would you encourage them, encourage them to do? What's a, a suggestion you would encourage them to walk away with from today? So I fundamentally, I would encourage people to build relationships, bring, open up your table, make sure that you have contacted the accurate people, indigenous groups that we are obligated to work with from the get-go. Do not contact them after um, the work is being done. <clears throat> Understand that um, you know, all there is not any individual band, group, tribe, region of indigenous people that are the same. Every single group is different. 
they are different. But we as an agency have obligations in the same way to every single indigenous group that we work with and every tribe that we work with. So there's not separation of this one or that one and we treat them differently. We treat them the same through our policies for sure. However, relationships are gonna be different. Um, belief systems to each group is gonna be different. Languages are gonna be different. Uh, relationships are gonna be different. So just um, <clears throat> understand that we need to make sure that we are really thoughtful of our approach um, to the groups that we work with um, as friends, you know, come as friends. Also know we don't have the best history, but we are working to make it better. We have recognition of that. Um, I see there's some questions. <laughs> yeah. Coming through a big yeah. time. Um, so we do one have, of them we do have is, time. okay. So one of them, you know, when you are approaching tribes or just using language, we always say things like, <clears throat> And I see this one, staff and tribal natural resource programs sometimes aren't tribal members. They can be descendants. They can be, you know, non-native. So we need to be really careful when we're saying, um, you know, we're working with tribes, we're always saying tribal members, tribal members, tribal members. It's any representative of a tribe that you can be working with that is trusted by that tribe to do the work to consult with you. Um, so we need to get away from saying that. Um, also standardizing processes with agency regarding harvesting and access, you know, those are all things that are coming up. Um, and let's see, thank you. I am really glad that Refuges has prioritized a full-time employee to do this work. Um, I believe there are some other, um, <clears throat> programs that are considering doing the same, but I can't speak for them. Um, I think it's great. And let's see. Okay. Yeah. So if there's questions on just, you know, where you can start doing this work, I would love, love, love to be, um, to share the resources that I have with everybody. I do believe, yes, yeah, standards of excellence used in urban are great. Um, working with tribes and, and using those as um, guiding principles of working with tribes. Number one, bottom line, relationships and trust building are gonna be the most important thing as we move forward working with tribes. Respect is very important. Um, <clears throat> and so just considering that there, there's a different relationship perhaps um, than someone else has to the land in which we steward. And so be respectful of the history of that. Um, be respectful of the tribal people that you work with within the service already. Um, <clears throat> definitely, you know, know that, you know, it's kind of hard. It's hard to be a tribal person working in the federal government sometimes. Um, you're definitely living in both worlds. And so, you know, just think about that as you move through your work. All right. Well, thank you, Amy. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, Amy, we appreciate that you've shared your time with us and shared your knowledge and your experience with us uh, working in the role that you do. And we hope all of you can join us next month, uh, Wednesday, May 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern time for our next Indigenous Connections broadcast. And as a reminder, each broadcast is recorded and eventually posted to NCTC's website. If you wish to learn more about this broadcast series or to be added to the listserv, please just email myself. It's Jennifer underscore Hill at FWS.gov. I also gladly welcome your broadcast suggestions. So you can email those to me as well. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good day. <laughs>